Adam was effeminate and his wife was a feminist. Eve was a feminist because she didn't want to listen to her husband. She didn't want to listen to God and she allowed her base inclinations and the whisperings of Satan to guide her. And that's, you know, what does that sound like today? It doesn't sound like go eat fruit from the tree. It sounds like, oh, you can go, you can be anything you want to be, right? You could be a man if you want. You can compete against men. You could be a superhero in all these movies like Batwoman and all these stupid movies now. They're teaching women, showing women that they can be, you can be just as strong as a man. You don't need to listen to your husband. You can kill your baby in the womb. You could take these pills and have as much sex as you want. You don't have to stay married to this man because what if you change your mind and you want to travel the world? You should have a career. No, don't have children. Don't make babies. The world is overpopulated anyway. Why waste your life caring for children when you could be a CEO, when you could travel the world, when you could save the world? That's what Satan's saying to women these days. Yo, Elliot. Yo, Elliot, I hope you're doing well. I've been thinking about something I wanted to get your wisdom on. So many of my friends are Christian, as am I, and are very good people. What I seem to observe is that many of them are blue-pilled Christians and are, for the most part, politically correct. It stems, I think, from the idea that by imitating Jesus, we should love one another and always avoid using harsh language or bad words, for example. If we love one another, we should uh, avoid going out in this time of pandemic for the safety of others. While I do sense that there's wisdom to the idea of avoiding confrontation and being lovable people, I also believe that it's disadvantageous to always respond with this sort of political, correct, loving, and kindness. It just doesn't feel right. My question is, how can you be both red-pilled and a Christian? And how do you show it to others who are Christian but have been effeminized by the church, family, etc.? So the first thing that came to my mind is the story about St. Paul and his dealing with Peter. So if you understand, as far as the disciples are concerned, Peter was like the Pope. Peter was like the first disciple. He's the one that Jesus uh, basically put at the, put in charge, put the church in charge. You know, they weren't even a church at the time. It was just a bunch of, you know, disciples. They were just his students. And he made Peter the first. Paul wasn't even a disciple at first. He wasn't one of the 12. He came much later and he was, he may or may not have even seen Jesus, but he fell in love with the faith and he was, he actually became like the greatest evangelist and all half of the new Testament is our letters or epistles from Paul. And so Paul was like the lowest man on the totem pole and Peter was like the top. And Peter was was saying some stuff that was wrong. Peter was was still attached to some 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 ideas that weren't resourceful for the mission, right? He was he was teach he was he was caught up in some false teaching. And even though he was a leader and everybody was just like, okay, whatever, they were just kind of going along with Peter and Peter was leading them down this wrong route. And it had to do with something it had to something to do with, with a kind of segregation where he was saying that you know there's we should sort of, as Jewish Christians, separate ourselves from the Gentile Christians. And he was making different rules for the Jews than for the, for the Gentiles, even though they were all Christians. And it was causing division within the early church. And Paul recognized that, and he went and rebuked him. <laughs> That's the word. He rebuked Peter. He went and confronted him. And he did it in like an aggressive way because of his, his love for the church and his love for Christ. He couldn't stand to see even the leader at the time ruining it, destroying it, making it bad. So he spoke up. Now you as a red pill Christian in a blue pill world, you can see how feminism is destroying the churches. You can see how apostasy is destroying the churches. You can see how this movement towards social justice without divine justice, social justice void of 
divine justice is a sin upon the church. You can see all these various things. This acceptance of degeneracy, sexual degeneracy, abortion, divorce, LGBTQ confusion, all the various things that the church just accepts, D ridiculous rock music that they listen to, the ridiculous uh, warships that they do, rather than having reverent worship, they have these big rock star events. The whole thing has been feminized. And as someone who has love for Christ, you've got to rebuke those things. Like if they're in your presence, you got to point them out. You can't bite your tongue. Like imagine St. Paul, imagine Paul bit his tongue and didn't tell Peter that he's wrong. The church as we know it today might not exist. There might be a Jew church and a Gentile church, right? We're all lovers of Christ, but the real, the Jew Christians, right? I guess you could say are over here and they go to that church and, and the Gentile Christians go over there. That would have not created a, 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 a one holy Catholic and apostolic church. That would have created division right from the start. It would have started with a split. And one of the hardest things for the early church fathers to do was to create a unified church. Of course, eventually it split with the great schism some, what, 500 years later and then 1,500 years later with Martin Luther. But they kept it together for 500 years or so with no split, with no division. But it could have been split right from the beginning had not Paul been a gangster and was like, no, this ain't right. You can't do that. Even though he was the lowest man on the totem pole. And you got to do the same thing, man. Uh, I'm not saying you need to go out there and cause problems, but if you see people in your community uh, and you want to be a part of that community, the other thing is, you know, maybe don't be, um, or you're having conversations with friends, uh, you got to point some things out. You got to point things out that don't make sense, that are in fact wrong. And, and here's the thing, the same way that Paul did it because of his love for Christ, he didn't do it because he was angry. He didn't do it for glory. He didn't do it to prove a point. He did it because it was the right thing to do. And he did it for the love of Christ. When you rebuke your friends for being blue pilled and swallowing all the uh the 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 waywardness of this day you're doing it because you love them it's like well i would hate for you to a lot of people because we've watered down our conception of the scriptures to such a de great degree in this day, a lot of people are living in mortal sin and don't even know it because what everybody else is doing it, right? Everybody else is doing it. This is a big problem. And, and, and look, the Catholic, I, part of the reason why I like the Catholic church is because it's conservative, but in we're living at the end times and the church is more degenerate than it's ever been. This is it. It's at its final. They say that the church follows the life of Christ. And what does that mean? The life of Christ comes to its end in his passion. How does his passion begin, right? When I say his passion, that's when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? And asking God to you know, take this cup away from me if it not be your will. And then he was whipped, scourged, crown of thorns, carried his cross and was crucified, all that. It began with a betrayal. Somebody within his fold betrayed him. And right now what we're experiencing in the church, I'm talking about the Catholic church, but all of the church, all lovers of Christ, is that it is within the church that we're being betrayed. It is, it is the shepherds that are doing the betraying. It's the pastors that are betraying us. It's the bishops that are betraying us. The same way that Judas betrayed Christ. What happened after his... After he, after he was betrayed, he went to his death. He had the hardest time in his life. He had the, he had the most suffering in his life. Well, that's what, that's what we can look forward to as Christians. We can look forward to that kind of suffering because we're following, we're following the passion of Christ right now. And so all of the things that could go wrong are going to go wrong and we're going to suffer. We're going to be whooped. We're going to be scourged. We got to carry our cross. That's huge. We're going to have to carry a cross. But what happens after that? 
resurrection. Crucifixion, resurrection. Many of us may die as martyrs. Who knows? And listen, martyrdom may not necessarily mean death of the body. Martyrdom could come in the form of you speaking up, not being politically correct, red pilling your friends, and they reject you. In this day, it's a lot of character assassination. Not to say that physical assassination won't happen, but there's a lot of character assassination. And you got to be willing to allow your character be to be uh, assassinated. Understand that they might not understand, just like the Jews didn't understand. And Jesus went to the cross. You might have to go to the cross. It's the same thing. But you're you're 100 percent right, bro. And there's a lot of don't get it wrong, man. There's a lot of red pill Christians out there. Look for conservative Christians, right? Not ones that have which is, you know, 90 percent have been sold to the world. 90 percent have been sold to the world. Look for as conservative as you can uh, and learn to love dogma because all dogma is red pilled all dogma is red pilled what is and i you know i used to i used to denigrate that word i used to hate that word i used to be like oh dogma dogma is requires strength dogma wakes you up like a like running into a brick wall because you can't go no further we live in such a soft age right that you know uh you you, you the, there are no boundaries so people go into run into run through boundaries but a dogma is a boundary. Boom. You run right into it. It's a brick wall. And it's like, no, you, you just don't go any further out of faith. You recognize, no, you work within these bounds and that it is for your own good. And a lot of dogma is like I was talking about before with regard to a father uh, denying his children certain things because it's best for them, even if they don't understand. Remember I was talking about that in the previous question? A lot of the dogmas is the same thing. The reason why feminism reigns is because we've rejected dogma what does dogma say well read corinthians there's a dogma in, there's a dogma of the church as it relates to the order of the family and that is god in christ christ over man man over woman woman over children but we've got it flipped upside down today because we've rejected that dogma dogma and basically we've got children ruling the roost right Everybody does everything for the kids. Oh, but for the children. Dogma doesn't talk about, oh, but for the children. The dogma talks about spare the rod, spoil the child. <laughs> Discipline your children. And then the woman, and then the man is underneath. We've got an upside down world because we've rejected dogma. And so basically that's how we've got feminism running the world. And so when you got feminism running the world, remember in the garden, who did Satan come to? Who did the snake come to? He came to the woman. Because the woman is more easily manipulated. She's more, uh, she's more willing to yield and to um, rationalize sin. It's just, it's just our nature is not right or wrong. It's not good or bad. It's just what it is. And so basically now we have Eve running the world with the snake telling her what to do. And men being effeminate. And that was Adam's problem. Adam's problem and, you know, going back to your question about speaking up in terms of, you know, what's right and wrong and a lot of what's wrong in the world. I know I'm talking about women right now, but a lot of what we're suffering from is because um, feminism is feminism. If you can imagine like a spear, feminism's the tip like that's the end of it. Boom. Feminism's the tip. And Adam was effeminate. And his wife was a feminist. Eve was a feminist because she didn't want to listen to her husband. She didn't want to listen to God. And she allowed her base inclinations and the whisperings of Satan to guide her. And that's, you know, what does that sound like today? It doesn't sound like go eat fruit from the tree. It sounds like, oh, you can go, you can be anything you want to be. Right. You could be a man if you want. You can compete against men. You could be a superhero in all these movies like Batwoman and all these stupid movies now, they're teaching women, showing women that they can be, you can be just as strong as a man. You don't need to listen to your husband. You can kill your baby in the womb. You could take these pills and have as much sex as you want. You don't have to stay married to this man because 
What if you change your mind and you want to travel the world? You should have a career. No, don't have children. Don't make babies. The world is overpopulated anyway. Why waste your life caring for children when you could be a CEO, when you could travel the world, when you could save the world? That's what Satan's saying to women these days. He's not saying go eat from that fruit, eat from that tree. But basically all that is, is is kind of a metaphor for the same thing. But what the problem now is Adam and we're Adam and you know, you're, you and your situation, I know I'm talking in circles here, but come, I'm coming full circle. You and your situation, if you're going to take the road, take the road of Adam, you're going to be effeminate, which basically means you say, oh, okay, is that really what you want? Well, that's fine. I'll just go along with you. That's what Adam did. Adam was effeminate because he, he let his wife be manipulated by Satan. First of all, by not protecting the garden. And how hard is that today? Because Satan comes in the form of these smartphone, smartphones. It's everywhere. So how can you protect? Um, but then instead of recognizing, wait a second, uh, this might feel good, but it's not the right thing to do. And it is better for me to obey dogma. It's better for me to listen to my father. It's better for me to have that boundary and say no. And Eve, even if you want to do it, I'm going to, I don't approve of it. He should have said that. He should have said, I don't, even if you do it, you go do what you got to do. I can't force you because there's only one God, the father. I'm your husband. You know, Adam, Adam is not good to be a wife beater. So he wouldn't beat her up, but he would let her go. But he wouldn't have followed her. The early the ch the fathers of the early church used to say that Adam had Adam. One of Adam's greatest sins was that he wanted to be with his wife rather than being with God. So he followed her. When you allow these blue pill Christians to do what they do and you follow their lead is basically the same thing. There are so many examples of this. I struggle too. I struggle, men. I struggle with this. Uh, even as a Catholic, you know, and, and Catholicism has a, a, a has traditionally been more bound by dogma than most Protestants, but there are some there are some really uh, conservative Protestants out there. Don't get me wrong. Um, but the Catholic Church, even I, I struggle when I go to Mass every day because the dogma of the Church is that you receive the Eucharist on the tongue. But everybody, especially now since COVID came, everybody receives it on the hand, and. Great. I'm grateful that the pastor of the church, at least the priest, at least <clears throat> he allows us to receive it on the tongue. But we got to wait till last and we got to stand at the back of the church. So you got to go. Basically, it's like you, you know, you know, when you're a kid and they send you to the back of the classroom. It's like you bad kids who don't want to abide by, you know, our, our covid rules. Basically, you bad kids who want to obey God and his dogma rather than covid rules. You go to the back of the room. And you wait till last. And you know what I do? I go to the back of the room and I wait till last. It took me a little while to like to nut up and do that. Because at first I was like, well, I'm going to be the only one. But now I was like, that's it. I'm just going to be the only one. And usually I'm the only one. And you know who else is usually there back, back there with me? This is going to be sound crazy to you. It's usually old ladies. It's usually me. And a couple old ladies. Why is that? Why is that? Why is that that most of the men don't stand up? But old, you know who the who the, the staunchest dogma holders in the church? Old ladies, not middle aged ladies, because they still got something to fight for in the so called world. Old ladies who did their dirty work, <laughs> and they recognize that there's nothing truly to live for but the love of God, and so. It's usually me and, and a couple old ladies that's in the back. I look at the men and I'm like, you guys are a bunch of pansies, soft pandering pansies with your pamper on your face. So that's it. <laughs> Done. Yo, it's your bro Elliot Hulse here. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, you ought to know that it was a clip from one of my most recent sessions with my King Transformation students where, among other things, we get together about four or five hours a week and speak on things related to becoming kings in our lives in fitness, business, and with women. If you're interested in joining a like-minded group of men who are growing stronger every day in every way, 
in this degenerate age, then it's real simple. Just follow me on Instagram and then DM me the word King, K-I-N-G. And then me and my team, we'll get back to the details and see if you qualify. I hope to see you at our next session. Done.